The podcast for the inquisitive diver. Hey there, dive buddies, and welcome to the show. So, one of the topics that I want to approach within scuba diving is photography, but also I want to touch on free diving. So, my next guest, Rebecca Griffiths, is both. She's an underwater photographer that also free dives. Rebecca Griffiths, welcome to the show, young lady. How you doing? Hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah, good. Thanks. My pleasure. I'm just <laughs> squizzing through your website as we're as we're talking now. I love that. Oh, yeah. That first one with the turtle. <laughs> oh, thank you. And the humpback yeah. just giving us a wave. Yes, humpbacks. <laughs> one of my favourite things to photograph, I think, is humpbacks. Oh, I bet. You got, have you got a, a few of them going off at the moment, or is it getting towards the end of the season up there? Um, it's getting towards the end of the season. The last, well, I say that the last two times I've been out went out last Friday, and the whales were really far away and really far and few between. And then we went out on Saturday, and we came across a pod of about eight humpbacks on a heat run, oh. um, which was incredible. And they they vanished. They do this. They sort of you see them and you approach, you turn off your turn off your um, engine and just sit there, and then they completely vanished. And we thought, oh, that's a shame. And then they literally just popped up right next to the boat Ta -da. To have, yeah to come and have a nosy and it's like oh my gosh <laughs> it's crazy so so they're still out there but yeah just a bit far and few between so yeah yeah, yeah. that's all good stuff so yeah. um let's, let's, let's back it up a little bit um how on earth did you get into this what what drew you to the ocean how did it all begin um, so, well, I grew up in England on the south coast, a little sleepy town called Weymouth, um, surrounded by the ocean. It's very sort of rugged coastline, a lot of cliffs and things. Um, so I've always grown up next to the, next to the ocean. Absolutely love being out, walking on the beach, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, it wasn't until I moved to Australia about eight years ago that I really started spending more time in the ocean and, um, discovered scuba diving and going out on boats and things like that. And I actually learned to dive in Cyprus, um, did my open water course there, scuba scuba diving. Mm. Um, it was an amazing place to learn because the visibility is incredible, but mm. there's really not much marine life there in the area where I was anyways. <laughs> Um, very heavily fished where I was living in Paphos in Cyprus. And so um, it wasn't until I moved to Australia and started scuba diving here and was just absolutely amazed by the abundance of marine life mm. um, and just couldn't believe that you can go out on a dive and just see so many different species and things. Um, it's one and, extreme to the other when you compare it to Cyprus, yeah. isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, Cyprus was like... Yeah, I mean, yeah, great place to learn because it was just the visibility is great, but you don't see too much. But, um, yeah, so I started spending a bit more time in the ocean and I was actually watching a documentary called The Cove. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure if you've heard yet about the um, dolphin drive hunts in Taiji in Japan. Yeah. And I just could not believe what I was seeing. Um, that's for people who aren't aware. It's um, every year in Taiji in Japan they – drive in wild dolphins from the ocean into a little cove and they select some of them for captivity and then they kill the rest of the pod. Mm. And I just couldn't believe it. I was telling my husband about it and he was like, well, you should look up Sea Shepherd. They do some really good ocean conservation stuff. Mm. So I did a Google search and turns out there was a local chapter group where I was living in Adelaide and I went along and coincidentally, some of the volunteers I met had actually been to Taiji. And I said, well, what can I do? How can I help? And they said, well, you can go there and you can document it and raise awareness. Mm. And I just thought, no, I can't. I can't help. <laughs> <laughs> I was, um, at the time, I was teaching dance and that was my background was dancing and singing. And I was like, what can I possibly do? I can't. <laughs> it just, you know, it just didn't seem like something that I would be any you know how what could I do I had no use and hmm. no experience or anything but um I joined the chapter anyway and I started volunteering at market stores and things doing fundraising for them and I just kept I couldn't stop thinking about what was going on there and I just sort of decided well what have I got to lose let's just apply and see and about a year later I was on my way to Taiji Japan and that was the first time that I picked up a DSLR camera 
Really? Because, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like literally the week before, I was like, right, well, because the campaign essentially as volunteers, what you're doing is you're documenting it and you're taking pictures to show what's going on there. Mm. Um, that's kind of, you can't, you can't intervene over there. It's a completely legal practice. So um, that's essentially what the campaign is. So obviously needed to know how to use a camera. Mm. And um, yeah, my husband had one because he was really into macro photography but I bought a long lens I bought a 300 lens and I was just shooting in auto because I had no idea <laughs> what all the what all the buttons did and had no idea at all but um yeah off I went and sort of learned as I went along and that was that and I was hooked just absolutely loved photography I loved the process and I loved that I'd kind of found a new passion and something that I could actually do and felt that, yeah, this is a way that I can help. I can take pictures and I can show people what's going on mm. in terms of conservation issues. So, And that's the thing. I mean, we're now in a world where everything is all video and TikTok and God knows what on Instagram reels, etc. But yeah. there's always space for stills because stills still, they tell a story. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Um, it's not just jibber jabber from some kid in his da- dancing in his room, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so, did when it came to using the camera and getting out of auto, did you are you self taught or did you get any kind of help on that? Um, pretty much self taught, but I definitely have had some amazing mentors along the way. I've got a couple of really good friends who are photographers. Mm. Um, so when I got back from Japan, and I kind of thought, yeah, maybe this is something that I can do. Um, I sort of reached out to them and um, was like, okay, help, how do I how do I take better pictures? And even just certain things like I was YouTubing, how do I make the background blurry? <laughs> um, really basic things like that. And so my friends were really good and helped me and sat on Skype and saying, look for this button and then you need to learn how to do this. And <laughs> um, But, yeah, a lot of YouTubing. And I did end up signing up. I did a one-year course through Open Colleges, um, mm-hmm. which was good, kind of um, pointed me in the right direction to learn a bit more. But, yeah, I've definitely learned a lot more just through YouTubing things and um, asking my photographer friends, mm. how, how do I do this? Yeah. I, I mean, it's fair to say that I've seen quite a few photos now over the years of, of following everyone on social media, et cetera, et cetera. And I do form the opinion that, still start to they come into categories and you've got those that are the natural shot that just are just freaking perfect full stop as they are and then there's those that are edited slightly and then there's those that people want to design art rather than what was seen with the naked eye and for me i've got to ask i don't you can't be doing much editing on these photos they they look they look like they're virtually untouched yeah um thank you that's a compliment because um yeah I I do (laughs) thank you yeah I do prefer not to edit too too much um I think because obviously what I'm photographing is wildlife and nature and conservation issues as they're happening so I don't I I don't think they really need editing Mm because I'm trying to I'm you know trying to tell that animal story so if I edit it too much then it takes away from the real situation that I'm documenting. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And um, so how, how, did, um, how did you get to start doing stuff underwater? I and mean, obviously it was uh, above, above the water surface when you were in Japan. Yeah. How did we go for the, for the dive in? Um, so that all happened through um, one of the Sea Shepherd campaigns I was involved with, um, which I know you will know about because you've spoken to the campaign leader. So that was the um, Apex Harmony campaign. Jono. Um, yeah, Jono. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I moved to Queensland about four years ago and I saw that that campaign was happening and I introduced myself to Jono and bugged him until he <laughs> let me out on the boat with him. Yeah. Um, so we're obviously out on the boat um, going up and down the coast um, looking at the shark nets and drum lines mm-hmm. and um, very quickly realized that I would need to be able to take good underwater photos to be able to effectively show what was happening under the surface mm. on those shark nets and drum lines. So um, Jono did have a, a little setup, but I'm kind of one of those people that wants my own 
stuff so that I can really control what I'm doing and know what I'm doing. So um, I invested in and under I, at that stage is when I actually upgraded all my gear and um, stopped stealing my husband's camera and um, <laughs> especially because I was going to start taking it underwater and I was slightly terrified that I might drown it and <laughs> yeah so yeah I invested in a in a full frame camera and um, an underwater setup so what what camera do you, do you mind what camera are you on what are you shooting with um at the moment I've got a Nikon d850 oh Don Shilcock use... will love you he loves Nikon <laughs> and um yeah a Aquatica housing okay and do you use strobes at all or is it all because it's relatively no. shallow on the nets isn't it yeah pretty much everything i have um shot i haven't felt that i've needed strobes i've been able to get away with using natural light mm. um i did look into it at one point but i actually did a um a session with darren Jew, like an editing session and i asked him do you use strobes and like said what i was wanting it for and he said you can you know as long as it's a good weather day you can get away without mm. without using them until you start going deeper so yeah yeah, yeah. i mean strobes are a whole a whole new kettle of fish as well if you've never used them before yeah. you just go yeah. back to feeling like a novice for a while <laughs> <laughs> yeah i still feel like i am a novice really in the grand scheme of things so <laughs> one thing at a time the, you're not the only one i feel like that now <laughs> just upgraded my cameras and i well, I've been um, out on two dives with them, and it, it's it's all yeah. fingers and thumbs and nothing coming out. Yeah. Oh yes, <laughs> yeah. And you kick yourself, and you come back up, and you're like, "I missed such a good shot because I didn't know which button or whatever you're trying to do." Yeah. <laughs> Wait till you get to my yeah. age as well, and the ice is failing. <laughs> uh. <laughs> That's just awesome. another added problem. <laughs> Excellent. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah. So, um, where did the? Let's talk about free diving a little bit because. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest, um, over the years when I've been teaching and, you know, you teach at resorts and, and dive centers and there's there's scuba diving tuition, there's free diving tuition and the two intermingle because you see each other in the pool and the sea and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So I've always had that banter thing of taking the mick out of free divers because they can't stay down long enough and all that. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, for years I was just continually taking the mick. And then there was something came up on social media. It was one of those silly things on Facebook. F post your first photo. And of course, I look back and sure enough, mine was me coming up from depth on fins and a mask and that's about it. So <laughs> the banter had to stop. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but what intrigues me is not only the, the diving under the water and being able to, you know, maintain that composure. You've then also got to add in that you're taking a photo and all of those settings that you've got to play with. If I'm down there on a tank and I cock it up, I can just stay there, sort myself out and take the shot again. Yeah. How how does it work with free diving? Well, let's let's do the free diving bit first, actually. Yeah. <laughs> where did you um, do your Where did you do your teacher your learning? Sorry. Um. So I actually, I only did just did a course at the start of this year, probably mm. about five months ago. Um. After just sort of snorkeling and doing duck dives, and yeah, I was just a bit of a glorified snorkeler for a, <laughs> a while there because um when we were doing that campaign with the shark nets. Um, especially in Queensland, the nets aren't too, too deep. They're in about five metres of water. Mm. And it's just not really practical to chuck on a scuba tank because it's so time consuming and we want to try and run the nets as quickly as possible. So, um, And it's relatively easy to dive down to about five metres. But I was kind of figuring out that I couldn't stay down there long enough, like you just mentioned, if you need to change a setting or whatever you know with the ocean conditions it's you want to be able to stay down there a decent amount of time to sort of get your camera where you want it and get a couple of different frames mm. um and that's when I sort of started think looking into free diving um and so for a long time I was again just youtubing things and trying to figure it out myself and then realized with the you know when you're holding your holding your breath in a vast expanse of water it was maybe a good idea to actually <laughs> learn <laughs> properly no I especially have to do it. yeah exactly <laughs> so um and then obviously with this year not being able to travel and everything i finally was like right this is the year i'm going to actually get into it properly so mm. i'm definitely still a very um beginner free diver but um yeah so i did a course um it's a two day course to do i um learn with um ada which is one of the groups that you can do it with you know like paddy or whatever mm -hmm. um the training was, agency 
Yeah, that's right, yeah. And the instructor I did it with was um, Scott Wilson, who's also an incredible underwater photographer, if you've Mm -hmm. followed him on Instagram. And what I really liked was that the focus was not about, you know, holding your breath for 10 minutes and diving down to 100 metres. It was just about, like, enjoying the experience of immersing yourself and holding your breath because it's not a hugely pleasant feeling (laughs) um (laughs) surprisingly um so you do pool training first of all you obviously like with scuba you have to do all your theory and stuff so you do that before the actual course Mm. um so you can kind of understand what you're doing and the safety elements of it um and then yeah you do the pool day um and the first thing that we did was just the breathing techniques and how to make yourself really nice and relaxed so Mm. that your body is in a good state to actually hold your breath for a long time. Um, So then you get in the pool and you practice your static apnea. So you're literally just lying face down in the water (laughs) and um, holding your breath for as long as you can. Under um, under the watch fly of of Scott. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, Yeah, always (laughs) with an instructor. Never, ever, ever try and do that alone, especially in the water. Yeah, yeah, and it's um, I've really enjoyed – the process of training for it because it's really relaxing actually and um it's like a really good mental challenge and you can practice at home just lying down on the floor in front of the tv or whatever you can practice doing that and um it's yeah it's actually a really good mental health sort of challenge because you're doing all the breathing like yoga you know it's mm. um it's really good for that and then trying to increase your breath hold so that you can um, hold your breath longer underwater mm. Have you found more people asking how long you can hold your breath for yet? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And, um, yeah, my static at the moment, I've got it up to two and a half minutes. Oh, well done. Yeah. So, and I think when I started, it was at like a minute, minute and a half, my first pool one. So, um, but I, yeah, I don't really practice too, too much. Yeah, I think I'll be lucky to see 30 seconds, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> you probably surprise yourself. And it's interesting because when I was practicing at home, just not in water, I can't hold my breath for nearly as long as when I'm in the water because, you know, when your face hits water, it's um, – I can't remember what it's called, but there's like that reaction when your face – obviously it's natural to hit water and you want to hold your breath, but it just seems to be like for your brain much easier to – keep holding your breath when you're under the water so yeah yeah probably sounds really stupid but you know what i mean <laughs> like it's just well, I hope natural we, i hope we will, we'll get a lot more free divers on here and yeah. um, get them to it you know get someone with some sort of authority in it that, that, that knows, yes. knows more than you and i absolutely but as far as i understand it it's it, the the impulse to breathe isn't actually the lack of oxygen it's the buildup no. of carbon dioxide co2 yeah that's it yeah. so when you once you've been down for a dive and you come up the first thing you do is actually exhale mm. so you have oh, really? to do yeah so you have to do what's called a recovery breath so you've done your dive or your static or whatever and you come back up and you um have to do like three x ex- like quick inhale and long exhale so you go to get rid of the co2 and get um get everything going again as it balance back as it should do yeah so and that's what you're fighting when you're trying to hold your breath and your um the uncomfortable thing is you start feeling your diaphragm do these contractions because it's like trying to tell you breathe breathe Hmm. but you can actually use them to your advantage because you feel them going and you can kind of count them and say okay well last time i counted five contractions and then i needed to breathe (laughs) <laughs> and you can, so you can kind of use that as a training tool to say, okay, well, this time I'm going to get seven contractions or eight contractions, and then you kind of just get used to that weird feeling and overpower your brain yeah. needing to breathe. Yeah, so it's all interesting and a good yeah, mind it's, challenge. It, it's scary shit to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, I had, I um, there's, a, there's a mate of mine, actually, Kent, a Swedish guy, lovely fella, and – um on numerous occasions, I'd be teaching, I don't know, open water or something like that and do skills down the sand. And you just see him pop down, you know, behind you, be down at like nine, ten meters and this bearded Viking swimming around. <laughs> When's he going to go up for it? And he just seems to be there for yeah. eternity. It's weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, I I love scuba, but I find free diving and holding my breath much more natural than scuba. Really? 
because to me I always used to freak out every every time I would get into scuba I would have to control my brain again and be like it's okay you can breathe and you can go down and you can breathe to me that was weirder mm. than holding my breath in water yeah so for me I found it more of a my brain just likes it more I don't panic as much as when I used to scuba dive so mm. I think I think that's a, a quite a common thing actually that you know you, you prefer one or the other yeah yeah yeah, and I think it's quite so. uh, quite common here in Australia, isn't it? Especially with all the spearos. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, um, okay. Well, where's yeah. um, sorry, Scott? Uh, what was his surname? Scott Wilson. Scott Wilson. Where's he operating? Yeah. Uh, what what centre was uh, it? So he, um, I can't remember what his school is called, but he, if you just type Google, Instagram him or um, Google him, his name comes up. He um, lives on the Gold Coast oh, yeah. or runs out of the Gold Coast. So yeah, in Queensland. So you got your qualifications? Yep. Yeah. All right. My first sort of first level in free diving. So I definitely love to do my advanced because I um what I'm battling with at the moment and especially with the camera is equalizing because it's a whole different technique to scuba equalizing. Um and then you add in your camera as well and it's a lot of thinking and <laughs> <laughs> trying to trying to get down to any depth with the camera and equalize as well so i would definitely love to do the advanced course just so i can get more comfortable with that process yeah yeah, yeah. is he um get down free diving yeah that's oh, the one there you go found you good day yeah. dude nice one oh, he's got a shot yeah. behind him as well well done yeah his photos are incredible yeah uh, to be honest, I've probably seen them on online, but not. Yeah. I'm not making the link between the name and the photos at the moment. Yeah. Oh, yes, good look. Yeah. Okay, let's. Um, so we had the, the campaign in Japan, mm-hmm. and you know, carrying on, clickety click click, and, and it's <laughs> on the on the website. I mean, you've done a fair few trips with Sea Shepherd now, haven't you? Yep. Where else yes. have we been? Um. So yeah, I got back from Japan and. Um, you kind of once you've been on a campaign and you're sort of waking up every day with that purpose of exposing something or you know you've kind of got a mission mm. once once I got back home I was just kind of like okay what's next like I couldn't just go back to my regular kind of day-to-day life so um as I said I was really trying to improve my photography because I thought that was something that I could contribute I didn't really have any experience on boats or anything um so I thought that photography would be the way to go for me to be able to contribute something. Um, so I applied to go on the um, ship's campaigns. And um, it was maybe, I think it was maybe a, another year after I got back from Taiji that I got accepted to go on Operation Milagro, which is in Mexico, mm. um, which is a campaign to protect the um, Vaquita porpoise. And there's only about 10 left in the world now because they have been a victim of um, illegal poaching. Um, So in the Sea of Cortez in um, Mexico, they um, illegal fishermen go and set these um, fishing nets. And what they're actually trying to catch is not the fajita. They're actually trying to catch a fish called the totoaba. And they cut out their um, swim bladder and they sell it on the black market. And um, it's extremely... Um, well, apparently, don't quote me on this, but apparently it's um, thought to increase men's um, – <laughs> you can see where I'm going with this. Yeah, it's meant to be a natural blue uh, pill, is it? <laughs> yeah, something like – something along those lines. Um, so it's kind of a delicacy and it, it sells – yeah, modern swim bladder sells for an extortion. I think something like – again, don't quote me on it, but something like 20000 US dollars or something abs- absolutely insane – and it's just unfortunate that the Totoaba fish is about the same size as these Fakita porpoise, so that's why they're getting caught in these um, illegal gill nets. Yeah. Um, and so Sea Shepherd's been there for quite a number of years now, and what they do is um, go out on patrol and look for these um, nets. And they use all sorts of um, technology on the ship to track where these nets are, and then the crew pull them out and... Um, get rid of them, chop them up, make sure that they can't be causing any more destruction yeah, yeah. in the ocean. So I went on, um, I was on the ship, the John Paul de Joria for three months on that campaign. Nice. Yeah. Three months, that's a, that's a good stint. 
Yeah. Do you, um, does does she, Sea Shepherd do do anything to help with getting you from from home to the location, or is it all self funded by the volunteers? Um, it depends um, what your role is and how long you're going for, and um, things like that. So, okay, yeah. I've just seen one of the. I'll, oh, I love this photo. I'm going to overlap it. When we do this video and I put it on YouTube, I'm going to overlap it. <laughs> okay. uh, the, the title goes with it. A white, a Pacific white-sided dolphin leaping from a small enclosure they are kept in. Earlier in the week, they had been captured from the wild. They will be trained for captivity in Taji, Japan, 2017. So it's a dolphin that's actually escaping. You go No, dolphin. they're just... <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I wish they could escape. Yeah. No, that one, I think I know the one that you're talking about was, yeah, we actually watched that pod of dolphins in Taiji being driven in from the wild. Mm. And, um, yeah, they basically, yeah, they get driven in. So these fishermen go out and they have these small boats and they use what's called a banger pole. Mm. So it's like this massive pole on the end of their, over the side of their boat, sorry, and on the end is kind of like a trumpet sort of looking thing and they bang on the top of this pole and which emanates sound into the water and terrifies these dolphins similar to i know you you were recently just speaking to sam who got back from the faroe islands yeah um similar a lot of parallels to what happens there yeah um so they drive them into this little little cove and then the dolphins that they look pretty or whatever that they want to use for captivity they will capture them Mm. and pop them in their boat and take them over to the harbour pens and then they start the process of training them for captivity. Yeah. Which is, so, yeah, so yeah, that poor dolphin was um, one that we'd witnessed earlier in the week being driven in from yeah. the wild. Yeah. It's pretty... Um, just nipping back over to Mexico there. Um, yeah. Did, did the, um, it, it's all right. You get used to it. I am tangible. Okay. I see a photo. No I'm worries. <laughs> In Mexico, are the government doing anything to help and a Sea Shepherd working with the government, all that kind of thing? I know they do. Yeah. Mexico, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. So when I was there, um, Sea Shepherd were working with the um, the government and the um, Mexican government were actually providing military to come on our ships and help us and keep us safe because the um, poachers um, used some pretty hectic tactics to try and scare us out of the out of the um, marine park where. Oh, the yeah? Makita, yeah. So, so what are they doing? Um, well, on my first my first week there, we had Molotov cocktails thrown at us. What? Seriously? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so, <laughs> were, you, were, you, um, were you there? On, was was Hubby with you, or did you go no. solo? Yeah, I just uh, went solo. I bet, he's, I bet he'd be loving hearing about that in your first week of three yeah. months away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's a land lover, so he's like, yeah, you go off and do that, and um, I'll look after the dogs at home. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so that was pretty intense because sort of the captain's like, everyone inside, Rebecca, try and get it on film if you can. So <laughs> I was kind of out on the top top deck we're always safe like sea shepherds really amazing at keeping their crew safe so um but yeah i was kind of sneaking around with my camera trying to catch capture on film what they were doing yeah um but yeah so that was a fun introduction to the campaign but in years years since um the year after i was there i know that they did yeah very similar throwing a lot of rocks and things they smashed some of the windows on the boats and yeah, it's pretty scary now. Mm. Um, yeah. And um, did you did you get that kind of reaction in Africa as well? I just noticed a photo that you were in Africa too. Um, yeah, so I went to West Africa two years ago now, I think, and um, was part of Operation Guego and Operation Albacore 4, which are both um, IUU campaigns, so illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing campaigns. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, we um, see Shepherd work with the Mexican government and the military um, to enforce the law of, of um, legal fishing, basically, over there. Cause the, they get a- the African government and the Mexican government yeah. have a long Sorry. stretch to get there. <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> Forgetting which country I'm in at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, working with the West African government. Um, so Operation Guego is in Benin, um, and then um, yeah, so they provide um, military who come on the ships with us, and then they also have um, the authority for us to get onto fishing boats and 
um, check what they're doing and check if they're legal, check if their catch is legal and all that sort of thing. Um, so, go on, sorry. I was just going to say that, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing that the governments are working so hard to protect their waters mm. and protect because it really illegal fishing really impacts the local economy and mm. you know because the illegal massive big boats come in and take everything and then there's nothing left for the for the locals who actually rely on those fish to feed their families and their communities and um so it's really good to see that yeah the governments yeah. over there work so hard to protect them yeah i mean it's a good example for the rest of the world really isn't it I know there's a yeah. lot of places around the world that are doing amazingly good stuff, mm -hmm. but um, Africa seems to have picked up the baton and really run with it. Yeah, it's very impressive. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so there's a few different countries in West Africa that Sea Shepherd are working with now, mm. which is really, really cool. So happy days. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, linking that all in, you're um, you volunteer on Sea Shepherd, and your job is to take. Is it just stills or video as well? Um, I just do um, photography, yeah, just stills. I have done a bit of video um, with some of the onshore campaigns, with the marine debris campaign. I've made a few short videos, but I definitely prefer mm. photos, definitely prefer photography over video. Yeah, I'm much the same. I, I'll have yeah. a play around with video, but, yeah, I, I much prefer <laughs> the enjoyment of making a, a good photo. Yeah. Mm. I like editing video. I quite enjoy that process, but I just – find the actual having to get all the footage and everything yeah i just kind of like the you know yeah just taking the pictures and it's kind of a, a more um instant kind of gratification <laughs> like yeah, when you see yeah. see the shot that you've got and um I, well, really I, th cool. I think you've got to have a particular kind of mind for to make a really good video you've got to have that skill because i mean no matter how much i've tried over all the kind of different expeditions that i've i've ran around the world and you think, right, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'll get that B-roll, get that done, match it all mm -hmm. to it. It's going to look amazing. And you think about it in your head, and it does look amazing. Mm -hmm. And then you get home, and you try and put it all together, and oh, I just can't do it. It just looks yeah. decidedly average. Um, yeah. I think that's as good as it's ever going to get for me for, for video. <laughs> it's just decidedly average. <laughs> sure, it's not. <laughs> well, yeah, I, you know, I could put a lot more effort into it, but I've just got too much to do, so it doesn't get yeah, to Definitely time consuming making mm. video. Yeah. But I think I like photo as well because it's um really kind of enjoyable capturing a you know, just one moment. Mm. And um I know like when I first like started to feel excited about photography was when you know, when you go you go diving or whatever and you get down there and there's just that kind of feeling of like, whoa, this is really cool. Like yeah. and I think when I and I would see pictures and be like, I would get that same kind of like, whoa, that's awesome. <laughs> and then when I was able to start capturing it as well, that was kind of like, this is how you can show people what's going on out there. Or hey, this is this absolutely, you know, like with the humpback whales, like to be able to capture a breach, mm. like it still just blows my mind that the technology is that you can capture this absolutely ginormous animal leaping out of the water and you can show that to people who wouldn't otherwise get to see it. Yeah. Um, and that I really enjoy that process. I'd, so, love, I'd love to get some whales jumping out of the water. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll see. I just, just got to keep trying. Yeah. So have it's... you got, have you found yourself, um, I'm assuming that you're very comfortable with your camera now. Um, have you got like a, go-to settings that you start with when you whenever you're going out to uh, take any underwater photos um yeah i generally i shoot in um manual but i shoot auto iso mm. um because i just have found it's way too the, the conditions just change too much when you're underwater like mm. um so i generally shoot about f8 um and about 1 250 for shutter speed Okay. And then I'll just let the ISO do its thing because mm. um, I I did try and set that when I was first sort of experimenting um, and begin and learning, but I was just losing too many good shots because you're down there and you're clicking away, and then a cloud will come along and just completely ruin it. And yeah, um, well, that makes that makes sense because you know, like we said earlier on, if you're on a tank, you can you can you can see it, you can view it, you can have another look yeah. and review your photo and, and change it. Yeah. So, yeah, 
You're not going to get but too even, many shots in two minutes, are you? No. <laughs> but even like when, you know, with wildlife, they move really bloody quickly sometimes. Yeah. So you don't always have the time and the luxury of changing your setting. So, um, and even with above water stuff, like when I'm shooting whales, it's, um, that sounded wrong when I'm shooting, <laughs> when, I'm, <laughs> when I'm photographing whales, um, it's the same, especially like you just don't know where they're going to pop up with a breach. So I'll usually go out on the boat and before I, we start seeing them I'll set get the settings all right first and then um so you don't have to worry about changing them too much yeah and yeah. I'm assuming that when you're shooting something like a whale breach um it's not just one shot you're taking it multiple shots per yeah and on quick fire for sure yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so it's um yeah taking about 10 15 shots in any sequence and it's pretty interesting when you go chuck them all in Lightroom at the end and you're editing them and it's like you get to see the whole sequence of the breach and some of them are in focus and so many times I've been like oh that would have been an epic shot but like that one <laughs> it's like at the end of the frame and it's just not quite in focus and you're like damn I could definitely <laughs> create an album of these would have been really good pictures if they had been in focus yeah. here's, here's especially the, for whales the outtakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly Oh dear. Yeah. So um for for those people that are out there and and you know we've got so many people that take photos and everyone's got a, a camera haven't they on the phone. Mm -hmm. But those people that really want to get serious about it and have a, a proper play. Have you got any kind of tips, advice, uh ways of avoiding cock-ups that you might have done in the early days for yourself? Um just get out there and shoot. Mm. And um, I'd yeah, I'd probably just say get a get a if you know that you really want to take pictures and you already know that you really enjoy it, invest in a, a, a DSLR mm. um, or even just get a secondhand one. Like you said, so many people have them these days and are selling off their old ones or whatever. Mm. Um, and what I used to do was just I used to go out and photograph anything and everything because I just wanted to practice, but quickly sort of realized I, if I want to get good at something I need to like figure out exactly what it is that I want to get good at which for me was wildlife um and whales and you know marine life in particular so just I go it's especially like for underwater photography you just have to get out or get under the water you just have to because so much of the time you can go out and not see anything yeah um so it's time spent in the water is a really important thing yeah. But yeah, I think just going out practicing, um, looking at going into Lightroom afterwards, editing them, seeing what don't I like, why don't I like it, and then you know, looking up how you can change that. Mm. But um I think yeah, and finding your like you said, so many people do photography now, so finding what is it that you want to show with your pictures. What are you trying to co convey in your pictures and what do you want people to think or feel when they look at your photos? Hmm. Um, well, I think it, 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 I mean a good example, and and one of the reasons that um, your photos caught my attention, not only because they're bloody good, but it's it's the knock-on effect. And you know, everybody's most people have got Instagram and taking photos left, right, and centre, and it's likes here and likes there. But when you click on the photos that you have on your Instagram, it's generally followed with quite a few comments and, and several people asking if they can get a copy and work and they, you know, do you sell them, et cetera, et cetera. And that in itself is a massive compliment that people want to actually purchase the photos that you've taken. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping you're going to make some profit out of it. But at the same time, if that's not raising awareness in the best possible way, I don't know what is. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's definitely my goal. And that's why I got into photography because, you know, I mean, I, Growing up in England, as I said, I never would have dreamt that I would have been able to see a humpback whale in real life, let alone <laughs> go to all these other crazy places and see what was being done and have the opportunity to try and make a difference. And um, I think photography can be really powerful in that way because I could be wherever, West Africa, Mexico, Australia, taking this picture and somebody back home in the UK is looking at it that would never have been aware of that before yeah um and i think that's where it's good and that's where social media is 
good too because you know as much as I sometimes <laughs> hate social media um the good part of it is that it has such a, a reach yeah. and you can use it as a tool to raise awareness and start conversations and um that's what I hope that pe- I can use my photography and get people to feel that connection of when you first go scuba diving and you go whoa look at that or you see whatever you know a dolphin and that's just magical and mm. I think hopefully with my pictures I can sort of give people that feeling and make them want to get involved and want to protect those things as well yeah and it does it conveys such a message in, in a picture and especially with someone like me I mean I, I I'll openly admit I'm pretty crap when it comes to reading and I'd it doesn't entertain me reading, mm-hmm. but yeah. looking at photos, I take more from, and I'll take my yeah. time looking at one photo to look at all the detail within it. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure I'm not the only one in the world that does that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, maybe the modern modern day, everyone's just flicking really quick, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. If you can get, if your picture can make someone stop and then yes. read the caption and say, "Hang on a second, what's going on here?" Yeah. And that's when hopefully you know you've done a, a good job and you've done that animal justice. Mm, yeah and that's the thing so what's um what's next on the agenda for you then where's it going to um hopefully back on campaign next year hopefully just waiting for um australia to figure out what it's doing with its borders (laughs) and um yeah i'd really love to just get back out on more campaigns Mm. um and just continue to raise awareness um and even just like it's been great this last year actually because I was like everyone I'm sure and I really can't complain because I live on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland which is the most beautiful place and also been extremely lucky in this whole pandemic that mm. we've um, I've been able to get out and about and Queensland is so big that I've been able to actually still go on trips and things mm. um, so this year has been really great for that and that I've actually been able to go and explore places within Queensland and use that to improve my underwater photography as well and um, yeah met, met lots of different people doing that and like you said people commenting wanting to buy my prints which is really nice um, so I just want to keep keep doing that on the side and then go on campaigns whenever I can. So yeah. hopefully, hopefully January, February next year is when have you entered happen. have you entered any competitions yet? Um, a few. But um I've um I when I stuff first was entering them, I actually entered not very nice images of um like one of them I entered was a turtle that we captured on the Apex Harmony campaign who was hooked on a drum line. Okay. Um, and that made it to the final list of the People's Choice Awards, um, which was interesting that yeah. people would. But, I, I mean, I guess it speaks to people and they've learned and it was they've learned something from it, which was really cool. But, um, yeah, it's something that I would like to do more of and that's kind of coming with the more experience I've got because for a long time I had imposter syndrome <laughs> with with my photography and I was like oh but I haven't been doing it for very long and it's not good enough and so I'm definitely getting more confident now and um feel like I I would be able to be more confident to enter more competitions and um so I would strongly yeah. suggest you do thank you <laughs> yeah. and yeah. Uh, maybe it'll help you uh, just realize how good your photos are Oh, thank very you. good very good thank, thank you very much um so i just had a flashback to our conversations the other day i mean you just come back from heron island um lady elliot island lady elliot yeah how was that yeah spectacular i assume <laughs> yeah <laughs> unreal absolutely unreal i've been um it's been on my bucket list for a long time since i moved to queensland um but it's a little bit pricey to mm. get over there um, but this year, because of obviously tourism's been hugely impacted here, they've been doing discounted flights. Um, so it's been, that was my third trip this year. So <laughs> um, <laughs> me and one of my free diving buddies, we just were absolutely addicted. We just couldn't believe it because it's just, it's honestly so beautiful. It's this, it's a Coral Cay island mm. um, and it's ti- a tiny island, the air, airfield run, like it's, just yeah like over the runway is just a strip of grass going through the middle of the island and you get off the little plane and there's the dive shop and then there's like the reception and then the accommodation you can literally walk from one end of the island to the next and on one side is what they call the lagoon so it's really really shallow and you can only snorkel there at high tide obviously and even at high tide it's like half a meter a meter max to the coral 
Um, and on the other side is a bit deeper and you've got all the coral reef and then you can go out and there's loads of bommies and, um, yeah, manta rays, so many turtles I've seen. I think, yeah, I've seen quite a few different species of turtles there. Um, reef sharks, seen leopard sharks there. It's just, it's, it's literally like an aquarium. Like <laughs> you just yeah. go out and you see so much, um, and perfect to practice free diving cause it's, um, it's got some really beautiful like sandy patches that's probably about 10 meters that you can practice on and then you can get boats and go out a little bit deeper um, to practice as well so and just the most beautiful conditions like crystal clear waters and yeah it's amazing not jealous so. at all <laughs> <laughs> definitely when you can get out to queensland you gotta go you gotta go yeah and Absolutely. do you get through a fair few uh, sd cards i assume yeah <laughs> yes, I, <did. laughs> I put two two cards in, and one's a backup, so that if I fill up my my card, then it's um I've got that backup. But that's something I've been working on actually is trying not to just shoot a million pictures. So I've got so many to sort through, and actually thinking that's a good thing about that place too, is because there's so much to see there. You can get to go down and see, and sort of try and line up a shot, and not have so many to go through afterwards. Yeah. Um, that's that's that, a bit of a luxury, so- isn't it? It sounds fantastic. Yeah, yeah it's incredible. Yeah. I think a couple incredible. of um, couple of our friends actually um, missed out on Lady Elliot because of this recent lockdown. They're down here in Sydney. Yeah. In fact, it's one of the compadres, um, Lisa. She's been on the show a few times. Oh, cool. Yeah, she's the um, Sea Shepherd rep down in South Sydney. Oh, so they, cool. the, her and her hubby were due to go up to Lady Elliot and yeah. lo and behold, lockdown said no. So, awesome. Yeah, I think yeah. it was about a week out when it started as well. It's unbelievable. Good. Something, Good. something to look forward to. Indeed. Indeed. For sure. Yeah, it's amazing. So um, just remind me, how long you how long have you been doing this? Um, well, I went to Taiji in 2000, February 2017, so mm. about five years. Cool. Because um, what I wanted to point out to listeners, and in particular – people that might be interested in free time, free diving and photography and conservation and, you know, following this route that you've taken of bringing all three together. You don't necessarily have to be a super experienced expert free diver or conservationist or photographer to start down this journey. And, you know, we look how far you've come in just five years. It's quite a, quite a good example of what people can achieve if they really want to do it. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really good message because, yeah, as I said, when I first went and met those volunteers who just got back from Taiji and I was sort of all fueled up and wanted to do something, and they said, well, you can go, and I was like, but what can I do? Yeah. But if you feel passionate enough about it, then you absolutely can. Mm. And I think you don't you don't have to be an expert Um and I know that did hold me back in some ways because I just didn't feel confident or good enough. Like I didn't feel like my pictures were doing justice, you know, to the situations I was photographing. But you just work work harder, keep learning. Um, I think, you know, the world, there's so many issues facing the oceans at the moment that we need as many people as we can. And um, if that sounds like, you know, if you're passionate enough about it, you can absolutely teach yourself and learn from others. And the good thing too, you know, I found anyway with photographers. I used to, I used to be a dancer, and I can, as you can probably imagine, a lot of dancers are not. Uh, there's a lot of like bitchiness and jealousness <laughs> and that kind of is that kind of culture. So when I started doing photography and photographers were say, giving me advice and helping me, I, it was like so refreshing. Mm. And especially in the sort of conservation area, we're all trying to achieve the same thing. We're all trying to raise awareness and do something good for the planet. So, you know, that I'm more than happy to help people and, um, you know, give them tips and advice. And that's been really great. So I that's think, it. yeah. I mean, it's, that's it. It, um, it kind of changed my diving when I started taking a camera. You know, when I first, when I first started just playing around, I'd take a GoPro or something like that. But um, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, as I got started to get a bit bored with teaching and all that kind of stuff, and you pick up a camera again, the whole scuba diving thing changes because you've got yeah. a, a completely new element to this exciting sport 
and you know I include free diving on that as well because it's all immersion mm-hmm. yeah. and it just becomes so bloody addictive it's yeah fantastic and it's yeah. I think free diving's like the, the the perfect example of how good it is for your for your mind and your yeah absolutely you know, as you mentioned before meditation and getting in that calm state yeah 100%. whack a camera in front of you as well and away you go yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah i would definitely recommend it it's um yeah it's been awesome i can't wait to every time there's a, a trip going out i can't wait to go and try and get a little bit deeper or stay down a little bit longer and it's a really fun sort of challenge for yourself as well mm. but there's no there's never there's no competition with other people i mean there is a healthy one if you want it to be you know with your dive buddy or whatever but it's never like oh you can't dive as deep as me it's just mm. you know even when i i think i the last pool session i did and i held my breath for like an extra five seconds and everyone was like whoa awesome like way to go <laughs> it's just been a really nice community and um that's what i've taken from it as well as it's just really fun and everyone's really supportive so yeah 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 and, and again you mentioned the, the you know photography support or uh, photographers supporting each yeah. other yeah, I don't, I don't know a level board where people don't sit around and talk, discuss how they take particular photos and, and yeah. just let people know how to do it. You know, it's, it's absolutely, great. yeah, it's exactly. a great level. Up. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, as I said, I didn't. It was a, so refreshing for me coming from the background I had um, that people wanted to share and <laughs> learn from each other. And um, excuse me, you how know? do you do that spin? Well, you work twenty five <laughs> yeah. years and you'll get to it. Let me know when you get there. Yeah. I'm sure it's not all like that, but I was, can only speak from my own personal experience, but um, yeah. yeah, it's just really refreshing. And even again, going back to social media, like Instagram, I'll get photographers will message me or I'll message them. And then, you know, there could be somebody that you really admire and they'll reply and be like, oh yeah, I liked that picture of yours. And you're like, really? Like, <laughs> and um, so how did you do that? Or, you know, and it's, it's really cool to meet people that way as well and yeah. learn what other people are doing. And yeah, it's awesome. It's all good. Any any kind of learning is good. Absolutely. There was something I was going to say. Oh yeah, yeah. You know when you're doing the chart notes and stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's an old one now, but I think it was episode three, four, four. Might have been a little bit later, but four, five, six, something like that. I had um, Christian Parton on, who's a marine biology um, super guru from mm-hmm. back home in the UK. Um, in fact, look him up on uh, YouTube. He's on. Uh, it's called Shark Bites, but Bites okay. being B Y T E S. He's yeah. he's one of the founders of uh, Sharon, which is the Shark and Ray Entanglement Network. Mm-hmm. You get photos like this, uh, and obviously it's for Sea Shepherd, but whack them on there as well because they're building mm-hmm. a huge database on any yeah. kind of animal that gets caught up in in nets and fishing lines and yeah, stuff awesome. like that. Yeah, cool. I'll shoot you the link. He's a yeah, a awesome. Chap. Yeah, we're actually working on a um. Uh, one of the campaigns I am involved with on land is the marine debris campaign, which is obviously um, to do with plastic pollution and discarded fishing gear and stuff like that. And in recent years, we've been going to some of the remote, remoter islands in Queensland, like Mulgumpin and um, Tick Rura, which is in the Moreton Bay area here. And unfortunately, we've been finding a lot of turtles and a bird on one occasion caught in crab pods. Really? Um, yeah, which is pretty devastating. So that's something that we're working on at the moment is because um, there's really not that much sort of regulation around that here. So um, that's been something that's um, been a bit eye-opening and that we're working working on at the moment. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's good to hear that other people are documenting that stuff too. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. I mean, there's so many people out there and so many different foundations, charities, institutions, all this that want to do the right thing. Just pulling yeah. them all together. Absolutely. So the the more we network, the better the information gets out there, as far as I'm concerned. For sure, hundred percent. Yeah, that's cool. Cool beans. Well, Rebecca, I think we'll um, we'll wrap it up for today, and um, I'll I'll chuck it in the show notes or your uh, website and all that kind of stuff. Awesome. Um, but um, people can find you on Instagram, Twitter. Do you do Facebook? Um, yeah, I'm on Instagram and Facebook. Twitter's a lost one on me, but <laughs> <laughs> one too many social media things for me. Yeah. Um, Instagram, obviously, and Facebook because I can share my pictures a lot more. So yeah, and that, is that one of the the best ways for people to get in touch with you? Or yeah, Instagram is probably what I'm most active on. So yeah, Instagram is where it's at for me. Happy days. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. 
And um, Thank you. It's great. I'll be looking forward to much more fantastic uh, photos coming from you. Thank you. Fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully you can make it up to Lady Ellen Island soon. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. I hope so. I'll be a happy man when I do. Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Cheers, Thank Rebecca. You. Thank you very See much. See you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. This is Scuba Go Go Under the Sea. The podcast for the inquisitive diver.